Good evening, folks. Come on in and uh, find a seat, and we will begin tonight's proceedings. Good evening. My name is Anna Robbins. I serve as president of Cady Divinity College, and I want to welcome you to the 2023 Hayward Lectures. And I on their freshest work and emerging or disruptive ideas in the formats of lecture, conversation, and writing. Since the lectureship was inaugurated in 1965, Acadia has welcomed many distinguished guests. And you can see in our uh, calendar many of those names, uh, all of those names, and you'll find the, the list quite impressive over the history of the chair from Viktor Frankl, Yaroslav Pelikan, to John Webster, and Mark Boda, Oliver O'Donovan, Richard Bauckham, Christopher Wright, and um, Anna Robbins and others. <laughs> I couldn't resist, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a difficult year. <laughs> the Hayward Lectures focus on the theoretical and academic side of theological education emphasizing biblical studies, theology, and church history. But I will offer that that academic side of theology is not divorced from the practical expression of Christian ideas. In fact, uh, it is those ideas and thought processes that drive our action in the world. Approximately 20 years ago, the Acadia Studies in Bible and Theology series was launched, published by Baker Academic, in order to provide a publication venue for the Hayward Lectures, and to date, 16 volumes, 16 volumes in this series have been published. And so I want to add very briefly my personal welcome to Dr. Willie James Jennings, uh, who will be formally introduced by Dr. Danny Zacharias, but I am, amongst many others in this room, very excited that you are here. Uh, I appreciated meeting you just a, a little while ago over a meal, which is the best way to get to know people. And I think you will find that you are very much among friends, and yet we welcome even the most challenging word you might bring. Uh, and Danny will offer a fuller uh, introduction in just a moment. Uh, but interaction with our lecturer will follow each lecture, and it will also happen at the Tuesday morning McRae Center Red Sofa Conversation at 10.30 tomorrow morning. And Danny will have more to say on how you can submit questions to Dr. Jennings. I invite you now to join together in prayer as we thank God for these gifts of scholarship that drive us to action in the world, and we pray. Lord, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to gather together to hear and to learn. We pray that you will give us open ears, that we might hear the truth of what is said. We ask for open hearts that what we hear might fall on good soil and grow good things in our lives and in this place. We pray that in the midst of this exploration, you will inspire us and move us to be hands and feet of love and justice in this world. And we commit our time together to you tonight with thanksgiving for bringing 
this lecture to us for thanksgiving for one another, thanksgiving for this place of learning, and with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everybody. So Willie Jennings uh, is a gift to us to be here. It's a gift already to get to know him over the last two days. And uh, we like to give gifts back. So the first gift is a nice mug with water. So it'll be right here for you. 10% discount. So just give me the rest of the 20 afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Willie Jennings is the Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Africana Studies at a small college you may have heard of called Yale Divinity School. And he is among family here at ADC, being an ordained Baptist minister, along with many of us in the room and those online. Before that, he was at Duke University Divinity School at the graduate program. He's written a number of very important books. The one that's foremost in my mind is The Christian Imagination which uh, was in 2010, won the American Academy of Religion Award of Excellence in the Study of Religion in the Constructive Reflective category the year after it appeared. And in 2015, the Grawmeyer Award in Religion, the largest prize for a theological work in North America. I'm also, um, I also make use of his Acts theological commentary right this semester as I teach Luke Acts. Uh, it's an important work on the book of Acts, uh, and we've had some fun discussing it, me being a New Testament scholar, uh, and thinking about how different it was for him to write a theological commentary in the midst of uh, New Testament scholars who are prone to wordiness in their commentaries. I also want to state that he's had an important impact on us as a faculty, as we spent time uh, as a faculty reading his book, After Whiteness and Education in Belonging. And as we read uh, week by week chapters, it fostered important discussion amongst us for what it means uh, to teach in this moment in time in theological education. He's now working uh, on a major two volume, at least, monograph. He says two, I think maybe there's gonna be more that's coming after that. That's looking at the doctrine of creation but I don't know that he would want to say it that way, and he'll explain some of that later, why maybe we need to just ditch that whole systematic category altogether or re-envision it in exciting and in new ways. And part of what we're going to hear is his reflections going towards that particular work. And so it's a chance for us to be a part of his thinking uh, in his process of writing that particular work. So uh, please give him a warm maritime welcome to... To, our, to us, to Hayward Lectures, and uh, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It is a great joy for me to be here. I want to thank Dean Zacharias, Brother Danny, for that lovely introduction. And I especially want to thank him for the wonderful hospitality he has shown me since I've arrived. I um, came in yesterday and he picked me up from the airport and we went to downtown Halifax and we walked around and then we went to um, this restaurant. A colleague back at Yale told me they knew I was coming here and they said, Willie, you have to go to the bicycle thief. You have to go to the bicycle thief. I said, okay. And so we were walking around and I said, Danny, that's the bicycle thief. We have to go there. And so um, we had dinner there and he and I shared a wonderful appetizer and a wonderful second appetizer. <laughs> and um, then we had the same thing for dinner and then we finished off with a peach and bourbon cheesecake. Mm. I, I asked God's forgiveness when I got back to my room because it was, it was wonderful. But I want to thank him for the fabulous hospitality. And to your wonderful president, President Robbins, thank you for this invitation. I enjoyed a wonderful dinner with her and with Danny and with the Andersons, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Anderson. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me to come and to be here. My friends, I want to bring you warmest greetings from Dean Gregory Sterling, the faculty, the staff, and the students at Yale Divinity School, where I have the joy 
of serving. Yale University and Yale Divinity School is on the unceded lands of Agakwin speaking peoples, the Quinnipiac, the Mahogan, Mahegan, and so many others. And I have made uh, a promise that as I teach and work on that land, and my home is also on that land, to do everything I can to honor the way in which those peoples have cared for that land and to be a part of every possible effort to give the land back. So as I stand here before you, I'm a grateful man, thankful to the Lord and thankful to the life that I am allowed to live. I <clears throat> cannot tell you how long I've waited to give these lectures. The invitation came before the pandemic. And so to finally be able to give these lectures is so wonderful. I am deeply honored to have been chosen to offer the Hayward Lectures for this year. What does redemption have to do with the land? What does salvation mean for the places we inhabit and how we inhabit place? These questions frame the lecture series that I have entitled, The Redemption of the Land, Rethinking the Place of Salvation. In these lectures, I will explore with you what a doctrine of salvation should mean for our life in and with the land. And by the land, I mean the entire environment, including water, animals, dirt, sky, seasons, elements. And I also mean the built environment, from homes to roads, from buildings to neighborhoods, from villages to cities, and all forms, all forms of habitation created by design by humans and more than human persons. The problem we face, my friends, is that we who are Christian in the Western world have received a distorted vision of salvation. It is distorted in two fundamental ways. It is a vision of salvation that separates the body from the land and therefore thinks and imagines the transformation of the body and behaviors apart from the land. And secondly, it is a vision of salvation that has little to nothing to do with how we design and build and how we create habitation. That is, how we form the built environment. So in these lectures, I invite you to think with me about salvation in place. In so doing, we will consider how we came to our distorted vision of salvation. My focus, however, is less on how we got here and more on what it means to get out and the cost, the cost of getting out. We will begin where our salvation begins, not with Jesus, but with Mary. Now, let me be clear. Let me say this right away. <laughs> I am not making Mary a co-redemptrix a redeemer. Salvation is in Jesus. But Jesus is with Mary. And we have not, we have not, especially we Protestants, have not taken Mary seriously enough as fundamental to understanding our salvation in place. What does Mary mean? Mary means the redemption of our spatial practice. Our second lecture 
will consider what it means to call anything or any place sacred. And what work, what work that claim should do in this world. Here we want to consider the emergence of a counterfeit sacrality that is all around us, riding on the realities of private property, real estate, and policing practices. The goal is to understand what, to understand the sacred as not simply a matter of perception, but also of our making, our creating, that is, of our artisanry. Our third lecture will turn directly to the problem of ownership as a life-distorting way of seeing the world, of seeing the land and our bodies. With the third lecture, we want to consider what it means to live against a spirit of ownership and toward being possessed by the Holy Spirit. And what follows, what follows from that sense of possession? A life of sharing. Now, as we move through these lectures, I will draw on the way of the poet and the storyteller to guide us in our exploration by offering some of my own poems and stories, and of course, that of others. So, my friends, we begin then with Mary. To speak of Mary, the mother of Jesus, is to invoke a world and a way of being in this world. Everything about salvation for us begins with Mary. It remains a strange fact that reflection on Jesus is often distanced from reflection on Mary. Most Christologies that scale the heights of technical acumen and conceptual sophistication give scant consideration of Mary. Now, this is not to deny that Mariology and Christology developed under different theoretical pressures and different devotional regimes, but that difference carries little persuasive power if we take Mary seriously. Yet what does it mean to take Mary seriously? What does it mean for Baptists to take Mary seriously? Now this has been a question that has haunted Christian thought from the beginning. But let's add to that question. What does it mean to take Mary seriously with a view toward habitation? My friends, we must hold Jesus close to Mary. Holding Jesus close to Mary allows us to do something that's rarely done, which is to give Mary her full humanity. This means thinking alongside her into the God-drenched reality that was her life. Such thinking quickly abandons any desire to locate the historical Mary, that is, to strip away centuries of theological reflection and spiritual discernment to recalibrate a history of Mary. My thinking alongside Mary will not be a historical quest to locate the real Mary, but it will shun, it will shun the instrumentalization of Mary's body, the turning of her into a tool for God's use. It will also resist deploying her life for creating regimes of purity that colonize sexuality. I will, seek, I will seek to show the importance of Mary for salvation while resisting mapping metaphor across Mary's body. And here I will follow the wisdom of the Catholic theologian Elizabeth Johnson who reminds us of what Mary is not. And I quote, Mary is not a model a type, an archetype, a prototype, an icon, a representative figure, a theological idea, an ideological cipher, a metaphor, a utopian principle, a feminine principle, a feminine essence, an image of the eternal feminine, ideal an ideal disciple, an ideal woman, ideal mother, a myth, a persona, a corporate personality, an every woman, a cultural artifact, 
a literary device, a motif, an exemplar, a paradigm, a sign, or in any other way a religious symbol. All of these terms, she says, are drawn from contemporary religious writings. To the contrary, she says, as with any human being and with every woman, she is first and foremost herself. <laughs> I also seek a Mary who is first and foremost herself, but at the same time, Theodicos. The Mary I will seek is one who is poor, peasant, and living under Roman occupation, but also called by God. God calls Mary, and callings are always an invitation to enact, to make visible trust in God. And Mary's calling exists in two senses. There is the calling to Mary, and there is the calling of Mary. The calling to Mary means that she will embody the prophetic, expressing in Israel the prophet's legacies of tension in declaring the word of God in the presence of opposition to her very truth that God is in fact with her. We should understand her as someone called by God into ministry and witness. Mary is inside the story of Israel's way with its creator, agreeing to the specific contours of their life with God. The called Mary, the prophet Mary, <laughs> is crucial for us. And yet the Annunciation has a second sense of calling, well known but underappreciated and underthealogized. There is the calling of Mary. She will take on the task of being the mother of Jesus. God asks Mary to be God's mother. This request unfolds beyond the words of the angel in the Gospel of Luke and into the quotidian realities of a child's constant needs aimed at its caregivers. It is the unfolding already implied by the words of the angel. Greeting, favorite one, the Lord is with you. Here is where we must see the vulnerability of God and the grace of Mary. We, like so many in the history of the church, must pause at the mystery of the Annunciation and the Incarnation. Mary will be God-bearer but she will also be the pedagogue of God, the teacher of God, orienting her son to life with the God of Israel and at the same time, life in the land. I want to acknowledge the singularity of Mary, not as a model of motherhood, but as M. Sean Copeland notes, the great Roman Catholic theologian, Mary will enflesh the freedom of God and with Mary, it is a freedom to be taught and the freedom for Mary to teach. She will guide Jesus in his humanity as a mother might do. Now, of course, there is, <clears throat> however, no historical record of this guidance. No canonical or extra canonical evidence to support my claim here. We have no evidence that Mary held Jesus to her breast and fed him, and like other mothers might, spoke and sang to him while she fed him. We have no evidence that she washed him, and in so doing, caressed and washed over every part of his body. We have no evidence that she covered him when he was cold and uncovered him in the heat and allowed him to feel the sun on the skin and taught him the word for sun. We have no record that she sat on the ground with him, as many mothers might do, and showed him how to touch the dirt that she put his hand on a tree or a leaf and said to him the word for tree and for leaf, or held up a seed and said to him the word for seed. We have no evidence that Mary taught, Mary taught Jesus anything. But do we, do we need evidence, y'all? <laughs> do we need evidence? If we grant him his humanity and grant him Mary his mother, then I believe 
I am on solid ground to say that Mary tells him his story. Or more precisely, more precisely, brings him into her story. As any mother present to her child would do. Yet to say any mother is not to claim some universal mothering instinct active in Mary. I am suggesting that Mary took seriously the task of teaching God. Mary is the door to Jesus' learning of the land and the ways of his people with the land. He learns from him, from her, and from his people, including his father, about the seed and plants, and crops, and harvest, and rain, and fish, and water. Mary, however, is the first storyteller for Jesus, who introduces him to life with the dirt, with fish and wind, with the sea and the mountains, and the story of Israel, his people. That is, Mary introduces him to her own spatial practice. What is a spatial practice? I'm so glad you asked me that. A spatial practice is how one moves with the dirt, how one lives in relation between bone and dirt. A spatial practice is how one lives and listens to the land and how one dreams designs, builds habitation, and inhabits place. It is how one creates toward dwelling. It is how one shapes the reciprocity between our places of living and our acts of being. One more time how one shapes the reciprocity between our places of living and our acts of being. Our spatial practice, my friends, if you don't get anything else so far, get this, our spatial practice houses our spiritual practice. Mary brings Jesus into her spatial practice practice. How do I know this? This is certainly more speculation on my part, but it has good roots in belief in a woman who has voice, choice, freedom, and commitment to a child given by the Holy Spirit. It is also confirmed by believing in a God who listens and who intensifies that listening in Jesus. You see, Jesus is the intensification of the listening God from the sight, S-I-T-E, from the sight of the creature, which means listening like a creature to the land. It recalls for me my own mother, whose name just also happened to be Mary, who invited me to become a garden disciple. Allow me to share this poem with you entitled, Garden Disciple. She called me to the garden, that ritual of spring, announcing new life. There my mother on bended knee in black Michigan dirt as if praying like in church or at her bed, made me join her on the ground, now made ready through her sweat and knowledge and water. Reach your hand in deep, she demanded, and I knew what my obedience would mean. Now I would feel the wet soil covering my hand, enveloping my wrist, pulling up my arms, pulling me in. Boy, that's life. She would say, do you feel it? The blank stare on my face, <laughs> covered with boredom, told her I did not. I was spring and too young to feel soil knowledge. 
She smiled and told me to go get her seeds, dried and stored, hidden from winter for such a time as this. Her planting begun, her mind focused on a future that only she could see in the ground, each spot chosen for the plant that would bear witness. Soon, her time of planting would be done. My time of planting has now come. Imagine the other Mary, Mother Mary, guiding the child Jesus in earth touch. What to eat or what not to eat. What to notice and what to be awed by. Jesus learns from Mary of his people's oneness with the earth and their life of thankful, their life of thankfulness to God for the gifts of life given by the God of Israel, who is indeed his God. Jesus also learns from Mary that he is the promised gift rooted in the land itself. Thus, Mary, as first storyteller, is the earth storyteller who situates her child, the child of God, in the creation. And in this way, he hears the earth itself speaking through his own mother. This is where the redemption of habitation begins, where Jesus comes to the knowledge of place through the body. We find Mary guiding him through her own spatial practice and what it will mean to dwell and know through dwelling. It begins with Jesus being positioned by his mother to allow the earth to speak to him and through him at the same time that he will allow God to speak to and through him. Now, of course, we are not talking about the same kind of expression between a speaking earth and a speaking God, and therefore not the same kind of speech. Mary holds Jesus in what the anthropologist Eduardo Kahn calls the semiosis of the world, shown through plant and water, bird and donkey and every animal, through planting and harvesting, each and all communicating by enveloping him in the moving and responding, the acting and reacting, the reciprocity of living creatures, and thereby giving Jesus insight into hearing and knowing. Jesus will in turn inhabit with his mother the semiosis of the world. Mary also brings Jesus into her story of scandal, threat, and escape. She must have told him that death and its agents sought to kill him when he was just a baby. Again, more speculation on my part. These agents were people who had given themselves to violence and a fear of a future that they could not control. That's in Matthew 2, 13 through 23. Mary knew movement, uninvited, but necessary for survival. Mary knew fleeing and looking over her shoulder and thirsting for safety and vigilantly watching for danger and with it all, with it all trusting in God. If Jesus was a child like any other child, he could sense this even if he could not see this, even if it was not spoken directly to him by his mother, but it was spoken because he repeats it in his ministry, in his words, and in his body. What is crucial for us to note here is that through Mary, Jesus entered the struggle of life in the land with this relentless processes of being displaced, of being hunted by violence and made painfully itinerant. Might the echo of that struggle be heard in those famous words, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, 
but the Son of Man has nowhere, nowhere to lay his head. Luke 9, 58. Might we also hear in these words, wisdom, learn from looking and listening to foxes and birds and the ways they seek habitation. You see, Jesus, I'm suggesting, enables a new kind of depth speech. He is the voice of God who gives voice. He gives voice first by remaining always in his mother's earth teaching and always in the contours of trusting God formed with his mother's struggle. He will add to that Mary form teaching and trusting the reality of an invitation born of his own life with God as Father and his life in the Spirit. It will be an offer to join him in giving voice both to the will of God for Israel and the speaking of the earth precisely at the sight of his body. This one who speaks from the depths will redeem our spatial practice, renew it from his body. Now, to understand Jesus as redeeming our spatial practice reframes, reframes the way we have come to think of his relation to land, and that is through concepts of territoriality. That is, through claims of sovereignty and ownership over specific lands by specific people. Concepts of territoriality have been the dominant way through which we have interpreted Jesus' mission and ministry to Israel in relation to the land. Take, for example, the argument from W.D. Davies' fame text, the gospel and the land, early Christianity and Jewish territorial doctrine, where he argued famously that Jesus' ministry, this is W.D. Davies, Jesus' ministry de-emphasized the territoriality of Israel's covenant faith and turned that faith toward his own body. Davies saw in Jesus the deliberate displacement of holy places by a person. For Davies, Christianity, follow this, is not place-centered, but person-centered. And that person is God incarnate. Now, with Davies' construal, there were not many options. Either when we operate in a territorial vision of land and life, through which possession of land is essential to the performance of our faith and our well-being as people. Or we refuse such territoriality and live a kind of ethical detachment from any absolutist claim to a particular land. The stakes are very high with these alternatives. On the one hand, to interpret Jesus as disavowing territoriality, as inherent to his ministry, and collapsing the sacrality of land onto his body forms a theological counter to every geographic eschatology. The life of this anti-territorial Jesus undercuts sacred claims to land for any nation, as well as the theological justifications of any nation for the expansion of its geographic footprint, like into Ukraine. Yet on the other hand, on the other hand, to deny the territorial dimension of Jesus' ministry supported modern colonialist endeavors by resourcing visions of land as terra nullis, empty lands that are devoid of visible development and therefore devoid of specific claims. The colonial settlers refused indigenous ideas about the sacrality of land and with it their territorial claims to specific places. And as we all know, that refusal continues to do great work to this very moment. 
These alternatives, my friends, these alternatives have formed well-worn paths that lead us away from seeing the redemption of our spatial practice. Follow, following either of these paths, following either of these paths, moves us across the earth tone deaf and desensitized to a communicative world that could never be understood rightly if it is understood as property. Let me slow down and say that again. That could never be understood rightly if it is understood as property, as territory, as sites of ownership, fragmented, sliced, negotiated, and bordered. Yet if we return to Mary, then something different appears to us. The mother of God bringing her son all the way down to the dirt and deeply inside her dreaming. The incarnation is not only about God becoming flesh. It is God becoming one with the dirt. Through her hand, Mary's hand, leading his hand to the dirt and water and feeling the heat of the sun, the texture of plants, and all the delights of taste. Mary anchors our redemption in her son by drawing embrace all the way down to the bone and the dirt. Our redemption begins not with Jesus as the replacement for the land and place, but as the way to a new embrace. God embracing bone and dirt, and God in place being embraced by the creature, by the land. Mary opens the life of her son into a shared space and helps to form his life as, his life as a shared space. This God-human space begins in the aftermath, after Mary has said yes and the spirit has moved, not only with Mary, but also with Elizabeth. As Luke presents it, Elizabeth and Mary span the improbable to the impossible. Elizabeth was long past child birthing years and Mary a virgin. Their improbable and impossible form in the context of lives caught up in the reality of the angel's words. What were those words? For nothing will be impossible with God. Luke 1, 37. They are bound together by the working of the Spirit, connecting their children and connecting, follow me, connecting their dreaming. Luke 1, 39 through 45. Mary inhabits the prophetic and establishes herself as witness, again, down to the bone and the dirt. She becomes, she becomes an agent of revolution through whom God will, in her words, scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts, bringing down the powerful from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. The hungry will finally know, the hungry will finally know the goodness of the land in its fullness by being fed, and the rich will not be allowed to increase their wealth. They will go away empty. Make sure you got that part. Let me say it again. They will go away empty. There in the presence of Elizabeth, they form a space conducive for revolutionary designing, where dreaming and creating mix with hope that grasp the impossible. Now, let me be very clear. I am far away from, from conscribing Mary and Elizabeth to some domestic sphere. <laughs> This is a site, S-I-T-E, a site of revolutionary design where life in the land drenched in God's promised deliverance opens to new ways of dreaming living. Following the great philosopher Silvia Federici's important work on the spaces of reproduction constituted by women's multiple activities, 
This is the space many women have known where they grasp the power of their own production of life, of plant, of animal, of body, and building, and the creativity registered in their innovating practices. As the great philosopher and biologist Vandanda Shiva reminds us, it is the practices of women, the practices of women, cultivating new plants through ingenious forms of cross-pollination, creating new farming techni techniques that have yielded over many centuries vast varieties of foodstuffs, of medicines, building materials, and philosophies of life. Mary and Elizabeth, I'm suggesting, gesture this productive space. This will be the ground of a new form of habitation, one that moves beyond habitation formed through empire toward living formed in the reality of God's deliverance for all to share. From young Jesus being lost and then found in the temple in conversation with the elders to the wedding at Canaan where the adult Jesus is positioned by his mother to exhibit his calling. Jesus seems to be intensely sharing the space of Mary, following her spatial practice, caught up in her dreaming. Remember her words to the servants, do whatever he tells you. If we think Jesus' life from the space of Mary, then he never, he never leaves that space, but unfolds another space of dreaming and being from within it. Another poem for you entitled Unfolding, Unfolding. Who did you go out to see? Someone dressed differently, wandering in the wilderness, at home with the strange, Dancing in open air, perhaps, perhaps making new day sounds crisp, bright, bird loud, promised, hoped, forgotten, exhausted. Then he appeared, quickly waving, quickly waving. Water rising and falling with his arms, slow rumbling from the cloudless sky. Not me, not me, he said. You. It is that dynamism of an unfolding of the divine life and the unfolding of the life of the creature there at, beginning there at, Jesus' baptism that shows us what I call Chalcedonian freedom based on the Chalcedonian creed. It is the freedom revealed in the long-standing mistake of trying to think the natures, human and divine, to make sense of the person. I know I've gone deep on you here, but stick with me. Jesus the person, the child of Mary, makes sense of the divine and human natures. Yet it makes even more sense of Jesus, the person, to say first that he through the unfolding inaugurates the beautiful and slow work of revealing the divine life and creaturely life together and that work is deeply connected to another beautiful work, my friends, another beautiful work, turning us toward a new reality of creating divine and human habitation. Turns us toward a beautiful work of creating divine and human habitation. The unfolding energizes an invitation to design and build life together with God and with our co-creatures. Here is the outworking of God's embrace 
and God being embraced. We meet the unfolding of the divine life within the creaturely life, within creaturely life, and creaturely life unfolded within the divine life. We are therefore invited by him and through him into a new spatial practice to sense again, sense again, an animate, excuse me, a communicative world, to dream again, liberating habitation, and to build environments, housing, and other places, to build environments freed from earth to the heavens, and that nurture flourishing life. It is through Mary, Jesus has entered a space to become a space, entered a space to become a space and to lead us into the creation of a space. So you could ask the question, have I not, in saying all this, taken a long and superfluous route to arrive at last to ecclesial space, that is, the body of Christ, the church? You could ask me that if you want to be a smarty pants. (laughs) It would be more accurate to say that I have brought the church to the space it is called to facilitate. Indeed, I have come to the body of Jesus, but I have arrived here with something missing, something missing from most ecclesial reflection on the body or the body of Mary and most explications of the doctrine of the church. I've come here with a vision of salvation that holds the body and the land together in a spatial practice aimed at the creation of habitation. Salvation begins with the redemption of the body in place. Jesus invites us to form built environments in the freedom of God. That is no small statement. Built environments in the freedom of God. This would mean at a very, at a very, very basic level, the democratization of design. The democratization of design that so many are fighting for today, where the decisions about the very structures of the built environment, where the neighborhoods, how the neighborhoods are shaped, where the sidewalks are, where the bus routes are, where, where all the decisions about the price of homes, the pricing of homes, all the basic decisions about the very structure of the built environment are wrestled from the hands of the few, the powerful, the predominantly white and Western, and those who have learned to design like them in exclusivity, exclusivity, aesthetic elitism, and in the colonial logics of control, possession, and mastery. Yet more centrally, it would mean discerning the ways creativity must be redeemed by being joined to the enfleshed freedom of God. We live always amid the creative activity of taking apart, destroying, if you will, and building again. The problem of discernment is acute for us, given that we are embedded in long histories, sorry, my phone is ringing, long histories that have dulled our senses to the unfreedom created through our creativity, like people being paid to build their own prison and bring their energy, focus, and imagination to the task. That is what the built environment is now, us building our own prisons. The decisive question regarding our salvation then is will we dream inside and live inside and build inside the redeeming work of Jesus down to the bone and dirt. Yet, what does does the redemption of the dirt, the salvation of the land, look like? I've already hinted at the answer to that question by saying it has to do with how we perceive the land, listen to, and sense the environment, and how from that sensing we align our dreaming and our designing of habitation and how we participate in the life of Jesus on the ground. But it also has to do with the ways, in what ways we perceive the land and the environment 
I'm sorry, it ha also has to do with what ways of perceiving the land and the environment that we reject. What ways of living and being in place we should challenge. And what forms of the built environment that we should press against and seek to tear down and build again. In our second lecture, we will move into that redeeming work by considering how we understand sacrality and what it means to call anything sacred and how to discern and resist counterfeit forms of the sacred. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you so much. So just as we take a break, take a breath, think of start, think of start thinking of some questions, I can walk around with this microphone. Those who are online, we have just as many, actually more online than we do in the room, just to let you know, not to make you feel nervous or anything. Um, but uh, for those people who are online, uh, I mentioned in the chat, but just so you know, there's a new little feature there, Q&A, so please put your, your questions there, and uh, if you really like a question that someone else asked, you can give a thumbs up, and then I know it's an even better question, and I should get to it. For those of you in the room, if you have a question, but you're a little nervous, or you don't like talking in a microphone, you're shy, you can even use that if you go to the website, and you can ask questions there. But... I have the microphone, you're in the room. If you have a question, put up your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. Professor Jennings, thank you for your talk tonight and for your specific way of being present with us. Um, I wanna ask about so it's a two-part question about the Old Testament, which is one of the things I study. Um, in one sense, I want to ask a version of the speculative question you invited us to consider. What do you suppose that Mary would have taught Jesus about presence in the land, place in the land, in terms of the scriptures of Israel? How did the scriptures of Israel inform what she taught Jesus? And the other side of this is how the scriptures themselves are a teacher to us. So how do the scriptures of Israel teach us something about Mary? And is there anything to be learned from that? To inf you know, there's a, I feel like there's another chapter here on that in some way. But what do the scriptures of is Israel teach us about Mary, specifically maybe in her special roles as teacher of Jesus and mm, as, mm, as mm. bearer of, uh, of Jesus, Theotokos. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's a great question. Now tell me your name, please. My name is Daniel. Uh, last name? Driver. Oh, all right, Daniel. Yep. Thank you so much. So um, I think it's always important that what we, what we want to do when we think of scriptures is that we want to keep them embodied. So to say what scripture teaches and what Mary teaches, let's, let's hold those together that her spatial practice is also scriptural so that she is not teaching something as an add-on to teaching scripture, that it, it really is embodied, especially with ancient Israel, that the scriptures are not first, you know, like our Bibles, the Protestants, but it is really the, in the practices. So that being the case, how we think about what we call the Old Testament the, the question kind of crumbles right there, doesn't it? Because at that point, what Mary is showing us by her spatial practice is, is precisely what it means to teach Jesus word of God, recited, word of God, remembered, word of God embodied. Now, 
how we want to then look at Mary. And here's where, at the very beginning, I was wanting to be very careful. What we want to do is we want to not have Mary as an image in front of us. And then she becomes a transparency, and then we just see the words in the Hebrew Bible about her. And then she disappeared. And then what basically we're looking right through Mary at the words that talk about her. Because then what happens is we turn her into a role. We instrumentalize her. And so what we want to do is to allow the life of Mary to then fill out for us what it means to even look in the Hebrew Bible to see what it means for her. So in all cases, what we want to do is not simply make her a trigger for the Messiah. Mary came, had a baby, we're off. Why? Because that undermines her humanity. So when we, so when we, we think about Mary, then what we wind up saying is that, as we do with the prophets, of uh, all the prophets, that she, in a sense, summarizes and clarifies what the law and the prophets mean. They're in her body. And that's really primarily the, the very beginning of what we want to say about how we then hermeneutically will go back and start to read what the Hebrew Bible Old Testament says about her. Ultimately, what I don't want to say is that she was inconsequential, uh, inconsequential after she had the baby, as most Protestants do. <laughs> because your mother was not inconsequential if she had you, did was it? I mean, that's, I mean, there's a point. There's something pretty, pretty basic here, you know. But, but of course, for we Protestants, it tends to not quite kind of, kind of. Just, all right, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Jennings, thank you. Um, I, I listened to this talk as someone with a Catholic background. Yeah. Um, and I actually just got back from um, um, a famous Marian site in uh, Bosnia. Yeah. where she allegedly appeared uh, preaching a message of liberation during mm. the communist occupation in, Yug in Yugoslavia. So yeah. very fitting time for this lecture tonight. Um, you touched a bit on the Canticle of Mary um, at the visitation to Elizabeth. And I guess my question kind of stemming from that is, I guess, have you ever thought of um, John the Baptist and the role of water here? Like, I'm thinking about Christ's baptism by John. Um, as a means of sanctifying not just the waters of baptism, but water itself. And I'm aware I'm asking this question to a Baptist, but I guess how does Christ's baptism in particular uh, bring the waters of earth into the freedom of God? And what does it mean for those waters when Christ entered them? That's, yeah. a, great, that's a great question. I'm going to talk a little bit about this in the next lecture, but let, let's, let's think about that in terms of this one uh, idea up on the table that the incarnation brings God not only into the flesh, but all the way down to the dirt. And what that means, in terms of what we rarely spend time thinking about, is the, the two-fold embrace of the creature. That God embraces the creature Braces the creation down to the dirt and the water. But God is also embraced. And God being embraced is salvific. Okay, stay with me. This is really important. We got the first part. God embracing is salvific. We don't got, <laughs> good English, we don't got the second part. God being embraced. So that the waters, the waters, if you want to follow, if you follow what I'm saying here, God seizes the waters as now 
within the divine life. And the waters seize God, claim God. So that our own reality of participating in the saving life of God is both embracing the water. Now, as Baptists, you ought to follow this pretty easily. <laughs> and being embraced, being embraced by the water, one more time, being embraced by the water is salvific. That is what we want to think about. The, the language that later developments that later develops around the a sacramental vision of the creation is all inside of this trajectory. But what's crucial for us now is to see the, the pattern of living that is constituted in the life of Jesus. That to make full, to make, if, to, in a sense, to, to realize our participation in the saving life of Jesus involves land and water in ways that we have not taken seriously. We've made all that optional. Next question. I don't know if this is a question as much as a comment. Wondering, yeah, comment. Wondering if you've thought a little bit about um, just going back to your um, your imaginative but realistic thought about Mary. Your, um, what do you think about, or have you imagined um, what it means in the context of family life back then mm. um, that wouldn't have been single generation? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great... Oh, did I cut you off? Did no, I, well, well, maybe. No, yeah, 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 yeah. You have more you want to say. So, yeah, yeah, yeah so, I mean, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't have specific names of women, although, um, you know, to, to be a child would have been, obviously, to be raised predominantly by right, women, right, right, multi-generation, right, right, and uh, right. just to draw it to um, something I was thinking about as you're talking is within our own place, yes. um, if you go frequently to uh, indigenous communities, if there's a Catholic church, it's often named St. Anne Catholic Church, which tradition says is Mary's mother. Um, and that's, an, that's a, a saint um, that is, seems important in indigenous communities. And I, I, I can't help but think about the fact that um, in those cultures for so long, you know, it was the grandparents that raised the children because the more fit bodies had to be out working. Uh, to, to make ends meet. Oh, that's a great, great question. Um, let me tell you this quick story. I once gave a bit of this lecture someplace, and um, a gentleman got upset. He was got up and gave me a lecture. He was very upset. He said, Dr. Jennings, <clears throat> I have one question for you. Where's Joseph? Where's Joseph? <laughs> <laughs> and what he was concerned about was that he was imagining a nuclear family. So you know, Joseph should, was, should have been there, you know, the, at the father in his home taking, you know, where's Joseph? Where? <laughs> maybe, I said, maybe the nuclear family isn't the best image to have here. As I, but what you're pointing to is, is incredibly important, and that is if we understand Mary as, in a sense, introducing Jesus to the cloud of family witnesses, then her role is incredibly important in facilitating what he will learn from whom. But now we got to add the one element that's really important here that is, um, that's crucial, and that is the scandal. The, um, you know, in the Gospel of Luke, when um, he comes to the temple, and, and as you know, as an Episcopal scholar, many have already picked this up, when he comes to the temple, and he gets up and he reads from the scroll and, and then someone says, isn't this Mary's baby, Mary's boy, the son of the carpenter? Now, what most New Testament scholars will say is that that phrase, son of a carpenter, that's a bit of an insult. That's, that's not, oh, he's the son of a carpenter. They're like, oh, he's the son of a carpenter. That's interesting because it's saying, who does this dude think he is talking to us? But 
here's what most New Testament scholars bypass. The insult that is the son of the carpenter is tied to Mary's baby. Hint, hint. This is Mary's, oh, Mary's baby. Oh, Mary, okay, we know about that. Joseph wasn't a daddy, right? Right, yeah, okay. <laughs> son of a carpenter. So that we want to always remember Prophet Mary is scandal Mary. And we, we got to keep that in mind. So to say that Mary is prophet is she's prophet in the space of scandal and prophet in the face of people disbelieving her truth. And that is really, really important. <laughs> this is why Jesus is Mary's son. Not necessarily Joseph's son. That's, and that's, we're going to hold on to that. <laughs> Thanks, Tammy. Um, so, Dr. Jennings, I had a question, and it's maybe a question more of clarification of something you said mm -hmm. that you turned in a way that kind of surprised me. Mm. Um, you said that... Um, within a conception of territory yes. uh, that there were two different approaches to land. So one would um, devalue um, the sacral nature of territory. Uh, the other would elevate in a way, right? And so what I thought that you were gonna say in the first one about devaluing the claims, but you went on and said that colonizers ended up doing this, right? So that makes sense to me in terms of indigenous, uh, like running roughshod over indigenous um, uh, presence in land and ways of being. Uh, but then the reverse of that, it seemed to me, is also true that the colonizers um, elevated their own mm -hmm. kind of claims to the land, mm -hmm. right? And and so they were expanding their territory, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so. Do you see both of those moves as kind of part of a colonial imagination? Um, I, what surprised me was mm -hmm. I thought that you might say the devaluing of the sacral nature of the land, or of not of the sacral nature of the land, but of particular claims mm -hmm. to that would be positive um, in this sense. I, I thought of that right at the end of the book of Amos. Yeah, yeah. They have a very yeah, yeah, yeah. unusual statement mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where God is judging the nations mm -hmm. and God says through Amos, you know, Israel, did you not, you think you had an exodus? Well, yes, but so did right. the Cushites and so right. did, names two or three other right. Right, nations, right. Right. enemy nations, right. right? Who in the Israelite mindset would, were serving a pagan mm -hmm. God, right? Not mm -hmm. the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of thought, you were going to go in a, in that sort uh, of direction, right? Mm -hmm. We devalue any particular claims so that all can be kind of respected. But you resist that, yeah. Right. So, so you you were you were working in some in some interesting ways. So here's here's um, you, you put your finger right on one crucial matter. The, the colonials used everything, <laughs> so they they used the idea of the um, you know, the desacralization of land in order to undermine claim. They used the territorial claim to underwrite their own claims to the land. Well, of course, with that, they were inside, they were inside an important Lockean idea that they developed it. And because they developed it, they made it sacred. That is, they made it something God gave God's impartur to. But now, here is the crucial matter. The, the question is not who owns the land. It's what land owns what people. You, you flip it. That's what the colonialists as I'm going to talk about um, tomorrow, that's, well, actually Wednesday, 
That's what the colonists don't want. They don't want people saying the land claims us because that means I cannot break you, break the connection between you and the land if you and the land are one. Now, if you think like me that you own the land, then that can be changed because I can give you another piece of land and I'll take this one, but the other I cannot do. Now, come back to that wonderful Amos passage you mentioned and what's, what's crucial for not only in the Amos passage, but as we come to the life of Jesus. The point is not who is in the land. The point is who is in the land with them, who God is sending to be with them for the purpose of sharing life in the land. That's the difference. That it's an opportunity inside the desire of God that people would share together living. That is a problem if your goal is ownership. That's, that's the problem. The territorial vision is so powerful because it has shaped the way we read the Bible. We read the Bible inside of a territorial vision. So we read Israel's struggle over its land inside a territorial vision, which means that, I won't use the word a friend of mine uses, but we get it backward. Yeah. Bookmark right there. I'll pick that back up next lectures. Hi. Um, thank you for that amazing talk. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just have a question. I'm a, I'm a literary critic by trade. Oh, good. And I was uh, uh, fascinated that in the, in the things that you didn't want to, the ways you didn't want to read Mary, sort of included a kind of metaphorical that you didn't want to, uh, make her into some kind of metaphor uh, as, as that would be to dehumanize her. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I wonder what you would say to the, uh, the, the, the argument that maybe as you proceed there is still kind of a latent metaphor that, that Mary is in some ways identified with the earth, with the land, uh, which is not an uncommon metaphor. You know, most women are, are identified with land. E in Paradise Lost, let's say Eve yeah. is identified very closely with the garden. Um, I mean, do you think you avoid that? Or how, how does one avoid thinking like that? Is, is, um, is that a problem? Well, this is a great question. So there is a sense in which I want, I want Mary, along with all of us, to be identified with the land, not as metaphor, and this is where I'm going, but as a fundamental part of our identity. So this is where we're pressing. We're pressing, we're pressing, trying to, there's a, in our, in our minds, if we've been shaped in the West, that there is a line between the body and the land. I'm trying to erase that line in your thinking. If I'm successful by, the, by Wednesday, you will not walk around thinking your body over here and the land over there. You, you, that, that line will be erased. And you will realize that you and the land are tied together. And you will realize that there's been an incredible process, an educative process, a, a, an economic process, a geographic process, that taught you to put that line right there. So now, but there, there is a part which you, you picked up that I, I took out of this lecture because it would be too much for you all. There is a long history, a beautiful history, of what's called, what I call Mariological contemplation. Mariological contemplation. When you read early church texts, we Protestants tend to just run by that to get onto the important things like, you know, creed or doctrines or, you know, yeah, we get onto the important things, but we bypass. But when, when you read early church texts, I mean, not even just early, I mean, at this, up to this moment, what you will find with all these great figures is they, they will start to wax eloquent over Mary. Like, so what's the wrong Mary? Okay. 
when are we going to the, when are we gonna get to the doctrine of the Trinity here? <laughs> so there, there is this long, beautiful history of Mariological contemplation. To contemplate Mary is a fundamental part of what it means to contemplate our life in Christ. Because Mary is mama's God. <laughs> if you take that seriously, then you don't run by Mary unless you've made her an instrument. This is God's mama. <laughs> so you, you contemplate that. And then, so Marian devotion is inside of Marian, Mariological contemplation. So I, I held back all that because that would have been too much for you all. But that is fundamentally what I was doing. I was in an ancient practice of Mariological contemplation. I didn't do Mariological, I didn't do Marian devotion because that would have been, that would have taken you right over. I mean, if I would start talking about praying to Mary, asking Mary to intercede for, with me with her son, watch over me, that would have been just too much. You folks would have gotten walked out. But, so I didn't do any of that. <laughs> Because I've been way too much like, oh my God, he's a Catholic. Uh, I'm scared. I'm scared now. He's supposed to be a Baptist, but he's not like a Catholic. <laughs> Is he a Baptist? Is he? <laughs> yeah, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> but that, that's, that's what's at play here. It, it is important to, to remember that what Mariological contemplation allows us to do is that it brings Jesus fully into his humanity. It brings him fully to the dirt. Because if you can't contemplate Mary, there's a part of contemplating Jesus that you're not going to do. Right? Mary teaching her baby to walk. That's Mary teaching God to walk. M Mary holding her baby's hand to a tree and touching a leaf. That's Mary holding God's hand, touching a leaf. Mary saying to her baby, as the baby gets a little older, you see, you see, uncle, he's very sad. He lost his wife. Uncle sad, uncle sad. That's Mary teaching God what it's like to see someone sad. But doesn't God already know? Yes, but God has chosen to know through our humanity. God has chosen to know. God has chosen to listen. God has chosen to touch the dirt. Now what that means for us is that if we don't recognize God's choosing, there's a level of our salvation we do not yet know. We've taken him straight to the cross. <laughs> and the saving reality of his life, we missed. All right, next question. This is a question online. The person asked, uh, the way that you described how we look at Mary um, as an instrument or in a particular role rather than being herself, do you think um, that that has come to play in how women in the church are viewed, especially in the Protestant tradition? Oh, that's a great question. The, the straightforward answer is, of course, yes. <laughs> the, instrumental, the instrumentalization of Mary is tied to the instrumentalization of so many disciples of Jesus who are women. Because what is said is that your value is your use value. And what's also said is that you do not teach, you learn. So taking Mary seriously will do a lot to help us understand that God took Mary seriously. This is, this is a serious problem for we Protestants. It's, it's not that much better with the Catholics, but for us Protestants, it's very bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm 
Paul Abella, full disclosure, I, I'm an atheist, I'm not a Christian, but I was raised in the Catholic Church, and there's certainly a lot of um, connection to, to Mary in various ways. And I'm just wondering, your focus on earth and bone and uh, rootedness and practice, does it also play out to the, not just the functions of transmission of those practices to Jesus when he's young, but at his death, because you have the Marys that, you know, the disciples are all off in hiding, and you have these women at his death. And I'm wondering if there's also a sense there of a return to earth and rootedness and practice as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'll maybe not return, m maybe more the continuation, but yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you read the crucifixion story and ask yourself the question, where does the dirt come up, come up in this story? Where is the relationship between bone and dirt? Then you, then you see a lot. And, um, you know, it's always important to remember where the last place we see Mary in a sense fully in the New Testament does anybody know where it is where's the last place you see Mary five bucks anybody can tell me no yeah there you go Eparu that's right this side of the room ah. <laughs> Mary is in the room, in the room, when the spirit falls. And in fact, she is mentioned by name. She's in the room. Isn't that interesting? And the passage says, anybody, right, let's see, let, you Baptist, let's see if anybody can get this right. How does the passage put it? Anybody? <laughs> My God, don't grab the Bible. Don't get rid of <laughs> Somebody tell me, how is it put in the book of Acts where she's mentioned? It's a great phrase. Yeah, but give, give me the exact words. Give me the exact words. Somebody, somebody get a Bible out. Somebody get the Bible out. But this, you're close. This, this gentleman, he knows his Bible. Somebody else, get a Bible out. What, what, what is that passage says where it says, um, has, it's just Mary. In the, it's in Acts. Acts, what, one or two? Somebody tell me. <gasps> Am I in a Baptist uh, seminary? <laughs> what does it say? Okay, okay. Yes. Isn't that fantastic? That's, that's the last place Mary shows up. And it, it makes perfect sense, given what we've been talking about, that Mary is there. Uh, and almost as though the, the spirit coming will now close the loop. The spirit that came upon her in Acts 1 now here she is there with the coming of the Spirit. It's a great, great, great story. All right, so all you Baptists who didn't quite know that, you get a B minus for that. Ne next question. It took, it took the president having to, to recite. That's just that's shameful. <laughs> Hello, Hello, Britain, sir. I'm a little bit intimidated because I'm a student, however, I chose to speak up. Uh, <laughs> my question is this. I, I understand uh, how you opened us into clarity about Mariology. Yes. And you spoke about the scandal. I would also like to know how you link, how you link Eve in the garden to to the special practice of Mary 
and how you link the scandal of even the garden to this special practice that affected the life of Jesus Christ? Great question. So I, I, I purposely avoid that part of mirological speculation that ties Mary to Eve. And now we understand the logic of it. Christ is to Adam as Mary is to Eve. And we also understand that it's, it's a clunky analogy. And the reason it's clunky is because part of it grows out of a particular historical trajectory that tries to figure out how sin relates to the biology going back to Augustine. And so I've purposely tried to stay away from that trajectory, primarily because it tends to, again, turn Mary into a tool, but this time a kind of cleaning tool. Eve poured it into the world. Mary cleaned it up. I'm like, ah, uh, nah, I don't want that. Why? Because you don't need you don't need a real person. You just need a body. Just like with Eve. You, you don't need a real person. You just need a body. Uh, pour it into the world. Uh, cleaned it up. So rather than thinking Mary, or should I say, thinking Mary from Eve, better to think Eve from Mary. That is to say, Mary the prophet speaks the truth that the world must hear, including Eve. <laughs> this will be the last question. Wow, okay. Hi, thank you so much for um, everything you gave us. My question is, I'm hearing all this and receiving it with joy, and in the back of my mind, what is pressing on me, a little voice, is patriarchy. Oh, yeah. And, um, mm, mm. and then the relationship to ownership, and mm. women and the relationship mm. to ownership, mm -hmm. and how historically it had not been owners, landowners, other things, and been owned. Anyway, maybe you're addressing this more on, on Wednesday. So as much or as little as you want to say, but what do I say that to that little voice that is saying, what about the pressure of patriarchy that perhaps Mary pushes against? Well, you, you, you are, in a beautiful way, you're answering your, your wonderful question. So if you've been following, I think you have been following beautifully, everything is addressing patriarchy, I've said. And, and that's why the gentleman, that, when I've talked about this in a couple of places, the, the one place where the gentleman, what about Joseph? <laughs> because he was looking for the patriarchal foundations for what would make the home of Mary legitimate. So there are New Testament scholars, and, and Brother Danny knows this very well, there are many New Testament scholars who have said one very fruitful way to read the story of Mary is precisely as a frontal assault on patriarchy and to understand that scene of Mary and Elizabeth as culminating the silencing of patriarchy. Because remember what preceded Elizabeth being there, um, her husband being silenced. And so it's interesting that in that passage where it says Mary is with Elizabeth, no Joseph, no, <laughs> they're not there. And it says, the passage I love there is, and it's so beautiful for speculation, that she remained with her for about three months, it says. And that's where the idea of that revolutionary dreaming and designing. Now, I often think that maybe they got together every now and then as their children were growing up and continued to imagine. I have this great icon of Mary, um, and it's, it's this Israeli uh, iconographer, and she has Mary and Elizabeth uh, embracing each other, and, and their babies are waving at each other. <laughs> it's a great icon. But it's so powerful because it does say 
that a world is changing. And right at the site where patriarchy would normally rule, its rule is crumbling from within. Don't forget that the angel came to Joseph in a dream when he was thinking about quietly putting her away. And he said, do not do that. It wasn't, jo it wasn't Joseph's decision to make. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so I have one last question. I, I said last question. I meant for them. I <laughs> This really struck me when you were uh, speaking and you were talking about um, the early time when Mary is pregnant. Um, and you touched upon the fact that you, we have these hints of, of this denigration towards Jesus. We have it in the Gospel of John as well. Oh, yes, we do. Um, and some scholars have linked that with uh, Jewish conceptions of uh, mamzer, it's th those who are um, illegitimately uh, Ill illegitimate children. Yeah. Um, and we that know, would be... Yeah, we know who our father is. Yes, that's right, yeah. So you have this, you have this stain on Jesus through his life, but that's a stain on Mary too. Um, and then you add to that, so I'm, I'm doing my own speculation now, and this is where my mind went as you were talking, you add to that the fact that she was under threat and had to run. Um, and it made me think of um, work uh, in indigenous communities to heal intergenerational trauma. Um, and so the fact that Mary and her humanity may have been passing on trauma to her son as well. So my question that I stem from that, this is um, where I can uh, let you uh, have a break right after this, but why do we uh, fear going places like that because of what it presses in terms of our Christology and how we think about Jesus and, and why do we sometimes fear to go that way? Yeah, this is a good question. And it's a great question, Danny. We'll, we, we'll take this up for the next two nights as well because it's such an important question. The way I like to put it is that if many people thought Jesus was mad, you know, we, we see this in the Gospels that he's beside himself. If Jesus is mad, then it's clear by the trajectories that you're naming that probably many people thought he got that madness from his mother because she said the father was God. And so that, that has to be understood as a part of not only the gospel story, but a part of the trajectory of our Christology, that it is inside of scandal, it is inside of the claim of madness, that all of us in this room, had we been there, would have shared in that. And so always remember, always remember that the message of Jesus was a minority report. The, the justification, his justification um, after his resurrection was a minority report. His claims for innocence as he headed to the cross was a minority report. You would not have believed he was innocent. And so all of that has to be factored into. Now, you know, the, the language of trauma is, I think, okay, but we probably want something a little bit more flexible. I mean, we want to hold on to that. In the um, African diaspora tradition, there is um, the melancholic tradition, the blues tradition of, of people working with their pain. And the, the, it's the idea that you never seek to justify pain and suffering. Never. Never but you always seek to make it productive. You're not trying to justify it, but you're trying to make it do some work because it's there. 
And my mom used to say, everybody in this house got to work, including my pain and suffering. Got to work. Got to make it productive. So if there's anything we, we see Jesus making productive, huh, the shame of his mama and his own shame. Thank you very much. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. We put him to work. Uh, we made him answer a lot of questions, but uh, Willie, is, uh, he loves meeting people. So we have some refreshments over on the other side. Please say hello, introduce yourself, and uh, let's just take some time to say hello to one another, okay? Thanks very much, and thanks for those who were online.